Hi, and welcome to Conversations in Interventional Cardiology. My name is Andrew Goldzweig, and I'm the Medical Director for the Structural Heart Disease Program at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and Associate Editor of JSKY, the Journal of the Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions. I'm honored to represent JSKY and our Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Alexandra Lansky. You can find us online at jsky.org, J-S-C-A-I dot O-R-G, and follow us on Twitter at at myjsky, at M-Y-J-S-C-A-I. JSKY is home to all official Sky documents. We're here today to discuss a very important recent paper in JSKY entitled First in Human Experience with the Module Heart Device for Mechanical Circulatory Support and Renal Perfusion. This research was first presented at the TCT meeting with simultaneous publication in JSKY. At TCT, the device and presentation won the Shark Tank Innovation Competition. I'm thrilled today to be joined by an esteemed panel of internationally renowned experts. Dr. Philippe Genereux is the senior author of the paper. He's co-director of the Structural Heart Disease Program at Morristown Medical Center in Morristown, New Jersey. Dr. David Reisig is the chief scientific officer and director of structural heart and coronary interventions at Honor Health in Scottsdale, Arizona. And Dr. Naveen Kapoor is the executive director of the Cardiovascular Center for Research and Innovation and director of the Acute Mechanical Circulatory Support Program at Tufts University in Boston, Massachusetts. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. I'm going to start uh, by looking at you, Dr. Genoa. Uh, first, congratulations on this tremendous achievement uh, and on winning the Shark Tank competition at TCT. The module heart device from Puzzle Medical is a totally new take on mechanical circulatory support. Your team performed four high-risk PCI cases with module heart support. Can you tell us a little bit about the device and about your team's experience using it? I know that you prepared some slides to share. Uh, first of all, thank you, Andy, for uh, this uh, uh, introduction and for the invitation to uh, present our work. It's a real uh, pleasure and uh, honor to present this, uh, this work again. And like you said, we presented this for the first time at TCT this year. Uh, and really, uh, I'm honored to present on behalf of the full team and uh, of Puzzle Medical. Um, and I'm, we're going to review uh, the highlights of the first in human experience with uh, the Muzzle Heart device from Puzzle Med for mechanical circulatory support and renal perfusion. Here are my disclosures. So first of all, uh, as a background, so Muzzle Heart is, uh, is from Puzzle Medical Device, which is a Montreal-based company in Canada. Uh, it's really a novel modular device. Uh, providing hemodynamic support with three endovascular pump, not one, but three, that we initially inserted in series, and then we assemble in parallel into a self-expandable nitinol anchor, uh, which is implanted uh, for the purpose of this indication in the descending aorta. Um, so the current study that we performed will, uh, was, was to evaluate the feasibility and the safety of cardiorenal support with this new device. Uh, among a population of patients uh, undergoing iris PCI. So uh, this is the device that we, uh, we talk about, a novel device called Module Heart from Puzzle Med. So if you see on the left, this is the device in, is, uh, in, in its insertion uh, profile. So in series, you have three pump, the first pump, the second pump, and the third pump in series. Um, and they each uh, have a drive line. Uh, and then you have an anchor, which is a self-expandable stand. Uh, and then you have a docking uh, where the three pump will be assembled and dock. And uh, you have actually the drive line. So on the right side, you have the three pump unit that are built in parallel and uh, come all together. And, and they're housed uh, actually in a self-expandable anchor and nitinol, which is oversized for the aorta. Uh, and the docking station and, and, and the uh, drive line to power the device. The specificity, or the, the, I would say what is special about this device is uh, you have three pump, obviously, and each pump uh, are able to, to, to spin, actually to rotate between 14,000 up to 30,000. But uh, the benefit of this is each pump will spin at 14,000 RPM. Um, and, and the accumulation of the three pump actually spins each spinning at 14,000 RPM would provide up to 10 liter of flow, actually between four and 10 liter of flow, depending on the speed of, the, of each, uh, each pump. And uh, this is what we, uh, we wanted to do is really to decrease actually the blood uh, element uh, trauma, the shear stress and improve the efficacy uh, of the pump. 
Um, <clears throat> the first thing you're going to see has been done, I've been done with a 22 friends sheet, and I'm going to explain why. But the uh, freeze device that we're going to be using in patient in the US soon will use a 14 French and 10 French sheet femoral ligand axillary. So uh, we, we call it the tab real heart failure, and we'll see why. So this study was a prospective single center in Paraguay, first in human study. Um, the primary endpoint was procedural success, uh, defined as successful delivery function and removal of the modular device. And other endpoint include pump hemodynamics, cardiac hemodynamic, and, and urine output. So on two days, so we went in Paraguay and during two days, 28 and 29, we performed four patients, four cases, uh, uh, four consecutive patients uh, that underwent iris PCI with the modular uh, implanted via transfemoral approach. You're gonna see, I'm gonna discuss an axillary device in the future, but this was done with the transfemoral approach. A patient was iris PCI with some degree of LV dysfunction, but that's why it's not the goal here to, uh, to target patient with heart failure. Is our typical patient that we treat as uh, around 65 uh, years old patient, uh, mainly male, um, and you can see the EF vary between 45 to 55 percent, um, almost normal, very normal creatinine function uh, except for two patients, uh, and the coronary anatomy ran from a multivessel disease PCI with bifurcation, proximal LAD CTO, uh, or complex uh, proximal LAD with bifurcation. So. These, uh, these are a schematic of uh, the, the study result, actually. So the device was anchored via femoral in the uh, descending aorta, just above the kidney. Um, and what we saw, actually, we had 100% success. Um, all patients uh, went very well. We implanted the device uh, around uh, seven to eight minutes. We removed the device seven minutes. Um, and during the implantation, uh, the implantation lasts for the, 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 the pump support lasts for one hour approximately, the time to do the PCI. Um, and we saw the cardiac output, all the patient had a SWAN GANS. Uh, the cardiac index in increased by 25%. Uh, we had a decrease in LVDP around 80% during the pump function. And the most important thing is we had a, a significant increase in uh, uh, urine output by ninefold, as you can see in the bottom right, uh, when we start the device, after 15 minutes of pump, we increase the urine output by 350 cc per hour. Um, and there is no hemolysis, uh, as you can see in the bottom in the, in the middle. Uh, the LDH level were stable up to 24 hours um, post pump, um, during the pump and after the pump. And uh, there's no thrombosis neither on the pump. So in conclusion, um, the first human study uh, demonstrated the feasibility and safety of cardiac renal support with the modular heart uh, pump among a patient undergoing iris PCI. Uh, the modular heart demonstrates significant improvement in cardiac output, LVDP, but also and specifically urine output. And obviously future studies are planned to assess the outcome of, uh, associated with the modular heart, especially uh, in heart failure and acute on chronic heart failure and also in chronic heart failure. I'm going to show you a, a, a brief video uh, of the implant that will be an axillary. It's going to be a 10 French axillary and 14 French femoral. You can see uh, the three pump that are assembled in series. Uh, and then we're going to insert through a sheet. Um, and we're going to uncover the pump. You can see here to expose the pump, the first pump, the second one, the third pump, and then the self expandable anchor. Then we're going to pull on each pump to bring them in a series. The beauty of this is you can also, when you're done, recapture the device just put by pushing back the pump one, hour, one at a time, and then you can collapse the anchor and then put uh, the pump uh, inside the delivery sheet and you can remove the sheet. So um, that would be the uh, next version that we're gonna be using soon in US uh, and 10 French axillary and 14 French um, femoral. So thank you so much for the opportunity to present our work and uh, eager to answer your question. Wow, that's fantastic. I especially liked hearing about the lower profile of the device. Uh, the definitely original... wins, definitely wins the prize for the best medical device company name in the industry, Puzzle Medical. Uh, that's a great name. That's a start. That's a start. <laughs> so let me uh, direct a, a question to you, Dr. Isaac. You weren't involved in the module heart study, but you've been involved in many other uh, novel device studies. Uh, like any device, the, the module heart has certain more favorable and less favorable attributes. 
Uh, so on the plus side, uh, it's placed in the descending aorta. So that certainly uh, carries a lower stroke risk than an ascending aortic device. Uh, and the three parallel pumps allow for lower pump speeds. So uh, as Dr. Janela said, the risk of hemolysis is much lower. On the other hand, uh, the first in human device uh, used a 22 French profile. I right. uh, understand that's going to come down. Right. Uh, and it, there are a lot of moving parts. It requires intravascular assembly. Uh, so let me ask you for your, your candid initial impression of the device in light of this uh, very exciting first in human report. Yeah, you know, the past three decades, I've, I want to recognize Jim Goldstein, who uh, with me uh, co-authored the accompanying editorial in JSky. And, you know, we started off by saying this is exciting. The past three decades have been an exciting time or what we called the golden era of innovation. And this is yet another one of those uh, innovative uh, 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 devices for our portfolio. Um, it is concerning that it's 22 French, but it's early generation. You know, we, we see as iterations occur, these things become slicker, smaller, et cetera. I was, I was uh, amazed by um, the device, uh, the improvement uh, in, in renal function in the patients who had some renal dysfunction, but it neither is a direct LV pump nor an intraortic balloon uh, knockoff as well. It's it sort of seems to me to be to be a hybrid. Um, I, I would ask uh, Felipe, tell me in your mind the exact mechanism. You know, you opined on what the the exact mechanism is. Uh, is this um, is this uh, does this create a negative pressure head at the pump inlet to, due to venturi effect? Or how is it that you uh, you feel that this works? Yes, absolutely. So first I will address your question. You're right. 22 French was the first prototype, I will yeah. say. Now we're gonna be 10 French axillary, 14 French femoral. So um, like you said, it's like Taber. We start big, but obviously we prove the concept and then we go smaller. Um, yeah, this is an entrainment, uh, an entrainment pump. So there's venture effect, there's a pressure head and there's a gradient uh, between the uh, proximal and distal head of the pump. And um, what we see actually uh, is really we create a ventral effect and we unload the ventricle um, clearly by, uh, by this entrainment effect. And um, we saw that in the animal study that we perform, we have an increase in cardiac output around 25%, but also a decrease in LVDP. And obviously there's a balance between how much flow you want to suck in and, and, and you know, the, the flow that you want to provide for the kidney. Um, so we believe that, you know, for each pump turning at 14,000 RPM, which accumulation of much more than 40,000 RPM, if you have a single pump will do the job to create between three to five liter of flow, which is probably more than enough for acute and chronic heart failure patient. Um, and eventually for permanent that. So we see this as two, two indication, the acute and chronic heart failure. This is why the 10 French axillary will be exciting. So patient can ambulate. Uh, and then uh, eventually uh, as a percutaneous VAD where you can send patient home with it, you can ambulate um, and, and, and you, know, you can target patient that are too sick for VAD, not sick enough for VAD, or maybe why, why, why do we put a VAD at the end of the day? I think if this is reproducible <clears throat> data, especially uh, some of the, your findings, your initial observations uh, that there is a lack of hemolysis or other deleterious consequences. I think this could be very, very exciting for both acute and chronic uh, therapy. I will say, David, one quick comment about that. So in the first in Newman, we were in Paraguay. So we did LDH and plasma-free hemoglobin and we saw no change. So that's was right. very reassuring. But in the animal study, we did multiple animals and some 24 hours where we had a Ben Wilbrun factor dosing, which is the most sensitive I mean, you know that, but the most sensitive molecule, the largest molecule, and we had no effect at all on the Van Wilbrand because the pump was 14,000 compared to the Ampella where we had head-to-head -head comparison at 25 or 30,000, you see a drop of the Van Wilbrand, which is the regeneration is not fast enough to keep up. So we are hoping that we're gonna reduce bleeding 
uh, with with the chronic use of this for four hours you don't matter but for for two two days three days or a month you, that's matter and also the generation of pro inflammation with the thrombos and the clot so uh, we believe it 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 will have an important uh, benefit for uh, for the patient. Yeah, this is uh, really exciting stuff, Philippe. So congratulations. I mean, you know, my comments on the technical aspects and comparative uh, field of trans aortic uh, impellers and propellers is that this really kind of pushes the boundaries a bit. What I really like in the most novel part here is the, the low profile delivery system. Uh, you know, getting the French size down to 10 French, if that actually comes, does come to fruition, really pushes aortics into a different category. Um, it starts to challenge Second Heart, which are the uh, two uh, emerging competitors in the space. And then, you know, the original right hand catheter also was around 14 French. Um, it is important for folks to know that there are differences in the designs, right? So right now, uh, Module Heart will fall into the same category as aortics uh, in the fact that these are impeller-based pumps. So they are basically um, in line with the blood flow. And this is in contrast to the Second Heart device, which is a propeller based system. So it actually opens up and then helicopter blades come out and then it spins. The interesting thing is that, you know, the um, in terms of the RPMs, this is also another distinction. So as we start to create the classes of transaortic pumps, the RPMs of an impeller are around 44,000. Uh, the RPMs of an uh, aortic pump will also be around 20,000, uh, you know, in that range, 10 to 20,000. And the RPMs of the second heart device will be around 10,000 in a range in between actually eight to 12,000. So probably one of the lower RPM settings. And it's a very different thing with a propeller than an impeller. So it's important also to keep in mind that with an impeller, you're actually gonna create a pressure head below the uh, device. So at the level of the wheels, pressure goes up and above the device, pressure comes down. So one thing we, we will look for as you guys advance your studies is to look for any evidence of recirculation. Because what happens is as you pressurize the distal aorta, any of that pressure head pushes back and if it can get around the flow of the pump itself, then it starts to recirculate. So that's one thing to look out for is the true flow rate versus a recirculation flow rate. And the way to do that is to actually have deucers in the distal and proximal aorta showing that the proximal segment doesn't have an increase in pressure at all. It's all coming down. And in your study, I think you showed there was no change in the proximal aortic root pressures that they stayed stable. The other point that I wanted to make is that as we now start to think about this, because I think people get confused and, you know, uh, people ask me for diligence all the time. <laughs> I try to explain very clearly that, you know, when, when these pumps are being tested in high-risk PCI, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a a question mark as to whether or not that's really your target population, right? It's probably not. It's actually what you wanted to do for first in human. So using it as, as endovascular or mechanical support, you know, as you know, the way we think about that is does the device provide circulatory support systemically? Does it provide hemodynamic support uh, with uh, ventricular unloading? And does it provide coronary and circulatory support? So, um, and then the fourth box is renal. So these devices I find fascinating because they'll increase and create a pressure gradient, but they'll actually drop the pressure if they're at a high flow rate above the pump, and they'll increase it for everything below. So where you position it in the aorta will have an impact on where you're providing systemic support. It uncouples the aorta. Uh, and then for ventricular unloading, really the drop in LVDP is great and the increase in cardiac output is good, but the true ventricular unloading would be ventricular arterial uncoupling, where the ventricle has now got a very separate LV systolic pressure compared to aortic systolic pressure. So I think it's, those are some of the caveats to keep in mind. But I did want to ask, Philippe, um, so it sounds to me like the target population will actually be patients with heart failure. Uh, and do you think that's going to be primarily a heart failure reduced DF or heart failure preserved DF? Or is it reserved for patients? who basically have some renal dysfunction, uh, where do you see that kind of fitting in on the cardiac renal spectrum for the device? Felipe, before you answer, I, mm -hmm. I, I, would, I think the caveat in the question is you've done four patients. I don't mm -hmm. think we know what this is intended for. What I love about how you wrote this up and how you presented it is 
we need to study it. And obviously you're going to give us your impressions of where this belongs. Mm -hmm. I think just the idea that it was safe and feasible is a monumental first step that you didn't do harm. I mean, to ask people to ask uh, the innovators of the balloon pump uh, or the innovator, innovators of Impella, where is this going to land when they had done four patients is a tough question to answer. So now that I've answered uh, the first half of Felipe's question to, 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 to the point of the question, what do you think? All right. So both of your comments are very, very important. So the initially the genesis of this company, the, the key here was to create a safer impella, so or a safer van. So those things works, okay. So um, and the one of the issue we uh, look and the three co-founder, which at the time when he created this company, they were 21 years old. Okay, there was two engineer in med, in an engineering school and one med student that approached me for have my opinion, and I said let's let's do this, but. Uh, was to create a lot of flow with not a lot of blood damage. That was the key. Initially, the first device was transvalvular, as a matter of fact. We had yeah. three pump and transvalvular, like a big core valve above the valve with three impella. So yes, you can go there. But then as a company, and Naveen, you know that, and, and um, also David, so you need to focus. So we first say, okay, where is the biggest unmet need? Okay, the biggest unmet need we believe is an acute on chronic heart failure and, and, and also in chronic heart failure, we need a percutaneous VAD to go on, okay? So we, we, we designed the pump with a long-term six month, one year in mind. We need to be safe on the blood element, three small pump that's been not too fast. So, so that was initial thought was to create a long-term safe pump. So what are the steps so we can get, achieve this, this wild dream? Well, it's to go step-by-step. Step. First, iris PCI, four patient done. Then the next 15 patient acute on chronic with some element of non-responsiveness to diuretic. So there's so many papers lately about acute decongestion and what is the responsiveness and the time. So the first 15 patient feasibility study we're going to start within 12 months or so will be in US and in um, Canada and really targeting acute on chronic failure that are not responsive with, uh, with, with the medical therapy with some element of renal um, deterioration first step right and then if we show this that we improve we decongest the patient and we improve renal perfusion the urine output is flowing 15 patient then we go to the pivotal which obviously it's a little bit speculative at this point but will be the same flavor um, pending the discussion with the fda if you ask my opinion i can see this thing everywhere okay uh, yes we're going to do a right side for heart failure okay you incur that in the pulmonary artery you put two pump and that's it right of course uh, yes, I, can I see that as a, a, a complex PCI? Sure, but you know the reality is Impella is pretty dominating this field. And is there a real unmet need there? I don't know. Um, you know, to put a pump for two hours to put a little stent in the left main. Um, in Canada, we use uh, we use Levofed. It's working pretty well. So uh, you know, for me, I think it, it's to go where actually the, there's a real unmet need. And for for me, the future is in heart failure, acute and chronic and chronic where we need a percutaneous VAD that will be safe. So, so we can treat those patients that are too risky for VAD or not risky enough for VAD or, or you know, this bridge transplant where you, you do more harm to them. And when they have complication of VAD, the transplant is not good. So this is, you know, all of that. So very, very yeah, that's, loaded question. <laughs> that's a great, uh, well, that's exactly, you know, the point. I mean, so when you come up with a technology, you definitely want to figure out what beachhead you're landing on and trying to figure out what the market is for this type of technology. So the safety feasibility is great, uh, no doubt, David, but I think that as long as the company has an eye towards their target population and recognizing that it's unlikely to be high-risk PCI, I think makes a lot of sense uh, because as we just talked about the different components. So I think it's really exciting. I mean, uh, you said that you, I remember the original transvalvular concept for this device. And so what happens when you run the pumps in series as opposed to in parallel? Uh, you know, I mean, that was, to me, an interesting aspect when you first look at the diagram. Why not just leave them in series at the little French size? Why do you have to pull them into parallel? So to, to your question, so first of all, I have to say I read a lot of your article because I'm a structural heart guy and I saw what is the perfect positioning, T10, right? You, 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 you published those data, where to put the pump without stealing and you need to perfuse the kidney. And the recirculation is the, is the problem. So if you have a small pump, mm -hmm and the aura is big, 
and you have three pumps in series, you're going to have so much recirculation. So the, the footprint of the pump, like you mentioned, has to be big. So you, you don't want to have a small pump in a big aorta because you're going to create more that. And that's a problem with Procerian. And, um, you know, their, their concept works. Uh, we, we're very similar to them, but the problem is they don't have footprint enough. So they have a six millimeter or whatever pump. So they need 22, they need 20 French at least. Well, there's a lot of recirculation around. When you have three six millimeter pump together or three four millimeter pump, you have a bigger diameter, yet you minimize the recirculation and that's the key. So um, I think as you, to put pump in series, I, I think that's will, that will come back to your problem that you, of the recirculation. Philippe, can I ask you a question? You use the S word, steel. Is there a concern that if you generate negative pressure in the descending aorta, that you may be stealing blood from going someplace else that matters? That's a, that's a very good question. I think Mavin, you studied that also. But to answer this question, we did a couple of tests on the animal and um, we did the, the gold standard, which actually nobody did. We did the microsphere. So we did a microsphere study. We inject microsphere of, uh, in, the, in the LV we, and we sh shoot this in the body. And then we do that at the same time when the pump is in, 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 um, in, in, in active. And then we do an autopsy. And what we saw in the four uh, animals that we did microsphere with different ramp and different speed of the pump is there is no significant difference of microsphere in the brain, in the kidney, in the heart, in the coronaries. So to your question, if you crank this pump up, up like 10 liter of flow, of course, you're going to have a steel. The patient will not feel well probably, but we're never going to do that because patient heart failure need probably one, two, three liter of flow, a little tap to help them. So, and the difference, the brain is great. When you steal five millimeter mercury, there's a mechanism at the patient, right? You're going to auto-regulate and you're going to shrink, you're going to contra contract your vessel on the brain. The coronary uh, to, on the other side, we didn't see difference in microsphere. Aortics did the same work, similar, and it did show, they didn't show difference. But you have to be careful with, obviously, sponsor initiate role, uh, uh, work. And, uh, and, you know, I think we're going to see when we're going to do it in patient, but uh, I don't think it's going to be a significant problem especially if you go in acute heart failure or chronic heart failure. If you tell me the patient has 90% left main and 90% carotid stenosis, I'm probably going to say don't start there. Fair. I saved a hard question. I saved it for you, Dr. Kapoor. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, you, you've been a thought leader from the beginning of this field of mechanical circulatory support. Uh, our listeners may be familiar with some of the uh, not so favorable retrospective studies that have raised concerns about MCS devices over the last couple of years. Uh, I'll mention two in particular. Uh, Amit Amin and colleagues in circulation in 2020 published a paper that looked at Impella for PCI in the Premier database. They found a higher rate of adverse events than with balloon pump. Uh, in the same year, uh, Druva and colleagues published in JAMA uh, impella for acute myocardial infarction with cardiogenic shock uh, in the NCDR data, and they found a higher rate, that rate of adverse events with uh, impella than with balloon pump. Why might the module heart device be different, or for that matter, uh, aortics or second heart? Uh, what is different about these devices, uh, and what research is necessary to find out? Yeah, it's a great question, and you know, so thanks for asking me that. I think the the bottom line is that. I'm very concerned about complications, adverse events with any MCS platform. You know, these, these papers are important because they provide a cautionary tale about what happens when you introduce innovative disruptive technologies broadly. And what happens there is, I think it's very clear, and I, I said this, uh, and I think I've seen it on bumper stickers now, is, you know, pumps pump blood but it's actually the people who save lives. So all of these widgets are great. They spin, they create pressure gradients, they can unload, they can reload, they can create entrainment. But the real question is how do you use them? In which patient population, the technical aspects of the operator are critically important. And every one of these emerging technologies are gonna have the same questions, whether it's a 10 French axillary or a 14 French femoral or a 22 French you know, from the femoral approach. All of them are going to put patients at higher risk unless there is an algorithm and a very specific technique that operators have to follow in terms of how to implement these disruptive technologies. It's like handing the keys. Today, I took my 16-year-old for, for a little test drive to make sure she gets her driving test. 
And, you know, I'm going to put her in, 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 a, in a big SUV uh, versus putting her into a tiny little Audi or a sports car. And if you hand them the wrong keys and they haven't read the manual, it's a problem. So I think the bottom line is that it's a cautionary tale for all of us, especially on the disruptive innovative side. The early feasibility safety studies are done by particular operators with extreme uh, you know, talent. And the, the question now is how do you distribute that across hundreds of thousands of operators and patients? And that's when AEs are gonna pop up. So I think at the end of the day, uh, the 10 French size, the 14 French promise is terrific. It's a great direction. I think what we're going to see is when we take the, hand, the device out of the hands of Philippe and put it into hands of other operators with less experience, the question is how do they handle it? I don't, I don't think it's gonna be um, a, a insurmountable hurdle, but as I said, it's a cautionary tale. And you know, with the, with the papers that you're seeing, I think it's important to recognize they capture real world data. And the real world data is broadly distributed amongst a significant bell-shaped curve of operators and also physicians, patient phenotypes, et cetera. As Philippe said, he would never put this into someone with bilateral carotid disease or somebody with end-stage renal disease on dialysis per, per se. Those will all be excluded in the trials, but when it gets out in the real world, that post-market data really starts to un unveil some of the challenges of the technologies. And I think that's across the platforms. I was glad to hear you. Uh, I, I, I think that's extraordinarily well stated. Uh, and I don't. I, and I was pleased, Felipe, to hear you draw the uh, the comparison to Taver. I don't think anyone could have anticipated or predicted the rapid technology evolution in TAVR, uh, the enhancements uh, in, uh, in the TAVR portfolio, procedural refinements, simplifications. I think whenever you introduce a new therapy, like this, a potential disruptive therapy, uh, at the time you introduce it, you have to have an eye on the refinements of the device almost immediately. And it sounds like you're not, your eye is not only on the procedural indications, but the procedural and technological refinements. And I think that's going to be uh, extremely important to add to the, uh, the 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 body of literature that you have here. And I I share the concern that was expressed about, you know, complications with early gen devices. But it sounds like you're you're dedicated to simplifying this, much like Taver was simplified. Who would have thought? that the stroke rates with TAVR uh, would be as low as they are, or the vascular complication rates with TAVR would be as low as they are. It's the procedural and technological refinement. So congratulations on, on uh, identifying that as an upfront uh, priority. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Genera, Dr. Isaac, Dr. Kapoor. We're thrilled to have this conversation and we're thrilled to include this important paper and editorial in the sixth issue of JSky. Uh, please follow JSky, submit your own work to JSky. JSky is the official journal of Sky, and you can find us online at jsky.org, J-S-C-A-I dot O-R-G, and follow us on Twitter at, at myjsky, at M-Y-J-S-C-A-I. Thank you very much. <laughs>